Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple to use storage arrays. Visit drobo.com slash macvoices and use the offer code VOICES100 for special pricing for Mac Voices viewers and listeners. And by lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. For a free 10-day unlimited trial, visit lynda.com slash macvoices. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, the Mac jury is convened to discuss the new Apple TV. We have three experts here, or at least experienced individuals with the new Apple TV, to share their uh, their wisdom along with me, uh, because I also have a new Apple TV. So if you have one, great. Maybe we can tell you some things. If you don't, maybe we can convince you or steer you away, depending on your point of view. First up, though, let's find out who's here. And I'm going to work from left to right on my screen. Uh, first up, staying up late for us, Mr. Bart Bouchotts. Bart, it's great to see you. Hey, Chuck. Glad to be here. It, you know, if my eyes droop a bit, just you know, digitally prod me. I'll be fine. Okay, I I, I have the buzzer right here, Bart. You know, <laughs> just hit the button, watch Bart wake up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also with us, uh, the man who wrote the book on the first Apple TV, Mr. Josh Centers. Josh, great to have you. Thanks for having me, Chuck. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. And I would I would venture to guess that probably uh, there will be a revision that will cover the new Apple TV to take control of Apple TV. Yeah, it's in the planning stages now. And anyone who buys the old book um, from this point forward will get the new one for free. Great. Great. Well, we're looking forward to, to that after you've had more time, obviously, to work through the, the new device. Last but absolutely not least... I think he's wearing pants, folks, but I don't know because he hasn't. He, he, I don't and don't stand up, whatever, Mister <laughs> Mister Jeff Gamut. Jeff, it's great to have you back. It's awesome to be here. And uh, no, I'm not going to stand up because then you'd know whether or not I'm wearing pants, and that Chuck would take the mystery out of our relationship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I you know I think it's only fair maybe that you point out uh, what you pointed out pre-show that's on the wall in back of you. Oh, sure. I'll lean over a little bit so everyone can see my superhero and villain underpants prints. Jeff, where does one acquire prints of superhero and supervillain underpants? Etsy. 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 I should have known. Well, it's I a good thing they wear them on the outside because that way we don't have to, we know they're right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Don't help. Don't encourage him, Bard. <laughs> Oh, uh, so folks, usually what we do with these shows is we do the first weekend with, um, but that was a little bit difficult because of the way that the Apple TV launched this time. Uh, I, for one, did not get mine until until Tuesday after the launch, and we'll talk about my story. Um, so I, I want to start with that. Guys, when did you get your TV, your Apple TVs? And I think the question has to be asked, was this a bit of a botched launch uh, by Apple? And how about if we start in reverse order? Jeff, uh, I'll let you go first. All right. So the botched part, I think, was the pre-order process. The launch itself looks like it went fine. But for pre-orders, that that was a sore point for people. Like, I, uh, I, I pre-ordered my Apple TV right away. And, uh, and it didn't show up until just a couple days ago. So what I ended up doing on Friday launch day, because at that point we knew we could buy them in stores, I went over to the Boulder Apple store and bought an Apple TV, but I couldn't cancel my pre-order because it had already gone far enough into the process. So uh, now I have a second Apple TV that I need to go return. Sound, sounds kind of familiar to, to my situation. Josh, uh, yeah. how about you? I've had mine for about a month now. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, win a developer kit in the second round of the uh, lottery for that. So um, I've had one for a while, although there wasn't a whole lot to do with it until the App Store came out because uh, the Apple TV comes with just the bare bones uh, amount of apps. And um, also, it wasn't until just a couple of days before the official launch of the Apple TV that Apple even started allowing external testing, uh, external beta testing of apps. So I, you know, I, I knew people who were working on apps and they could send me screenshots and stuff, but I couldn't really play with them until, you know, it, it was kind of too late to even, you know, really have much of a, uh, leading advantage there. Um, as far as the launch goes, I mean, you know, thankfully I, I was able to skip all that stuff, but yeah, I mean, it seems like everyone, 
you know, it took it took a while for everyone to get their Apple TVs. Um, you know, I mean, it might just be that maybe there was more demand than than Apple expected. You know, I'm not really sure. You know, what the deal is. I mean, it could be a lot worse, right? You know, when uh, new iPhones come out, sometimes you have to wait three to four weeks or longer to you know get the specific model you want. So, I mean, as far as Apple launches go these days, you know, I mean, I guess it could have been worse. <laughs> Bart, I'm especially interested in your situation because, of course, you're in Ireland. You're not in the uh, the U.S. Well, my expectation was that I'd have to wait a few months because that's how it's been the last while. Like, I didn't get the iPhone 6 until I think four weeks or so after you guys. So I was very surprised when I went to the uh, to, to Apple.ie on the Wednesday before the Friday they came out to find I could order. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. And on Friday morning, I got an SMS message saying your order has been dispatched. Then I went home for a long weekend. I came back on Tuesday to find the box waiting for me. So it obviously arrived on Monday. I didn't see any problems. Wow. That's my, – my, I don't know, Jeff, you'll have to clue me in as to whether this happened to you. But I, I actually – got on and ordered my Apple TV before I saw anything on Twitter. I just happened, I think, it, I thought at the right moment to check the Apple store to see if it was on sale yet. And there it was. Great. So I hit buy, you know, send it through. At that time, I wasn't given any overnight shipping op options or, or anything other than standard delivery. But it said, you know, you'd get it October 30th to, I think, November 5th. So I waited a little while, started to see the notifications on Twitter that people were saying, oh, you know, they're available to order. Um, thought about it a little bit, got on chat with uh, the Apple people and said, hey, you know, I, I want to see if I have any options to upgrade the, the shipping on this. So they went away and came back and said, OK, we've upgraded you to next day delivery for no cost. Nice. So great. You know, I thought, fine, I'll have it the 30th. You know, at, at worst, it will show up the 31st. Still didn't show up till Tuesday. Oh. And, and, yeah. And, and I, you know, I mean, I guess it, it bothered me just because, you know, of tr wanting to do the first weekend with, um, which probably would have changed this panel a bit. But it just it's, it sh just struck me a little bit that, okay, we, we had this situation, yet there were other people that were getting theirs on Friday. And I'm trying, still trying to figure out why and how, you know, that would have happened with them as opposed to me, unless it was a distribution and, and shipping channel issue. Uh, I'm not sure where the problem come, came in, but it, it was clearly an issue. Uh, okay, so for me, when I did my order, I had the option for free shipping, which was going to give me a delivery between November 2nd and November 4th. Or for $17, I could do the overnight shipping. But they said, you'll have it between October 30th and November 3rd. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's really not helpful. If I, but, I, but I thought, whatever, I need to get this as soon as I can. So charge me $17 and, uh, and I'll gamble that I'll get it when, when I want it. And it didn't actually hook the expedited shipping to my order. And I didn't realize it at the time. So I ended up with standard shipping. And uh, and that ended up becoming salt in the wound for many other people that I know because on Friday, after I had finished setting up the Apple TV I bought at the Apple store, I got a shipping notice. And I had people that – or friends that had paid for the expedited shipping to get theirs hopefully on Friday. And they still hadn't even gotten notices. And, uh, and so then my uh, – so then we're on Saturday and now I have friends who had paid – 17 or 20 dollars for shipping telling me i just got a notice and then my apple tv that i had pre-ordered showed up on monday and uh and i and my friends that 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 had paid for the extra shipping theirs didn't even show up until tuesday so there, there was something weird with this whole shipping part and and that's why I'm saying that was the botched part of the rollout. The, the rest of, of the launch, I think, was really smooth. And it was, I mean, it was really easy to deal with. But if you're pre-ordered, there's a lot of people that, that were pretty upset because they, the shipping was weird and it, it wasn't consistent. Is it normal to, to have this option to pay for extra? Because like, the situation here in Ireland is just different to what you guys have. We There are no physical Apple stores. So there was no one here going, well, if it doesn't arrive by Friday, I'll just walk into a shop and buy one. There is no shop. 
So, you know, our expectations are very different. But I've never heard of this notion of paying extra for quicker shipping. Is that something Apple usually do? Because I've never seen it on our store. Well, it depends on the product. So, so there's a price point where if, if you're spending, and I can't remember what it is, I think it's $100 or more, you just get free shipping. But if you want it hmm. faster, then you can pay for expedited shipping. Now, oh. what, what Apple has done for previous product launches is that, you know, like with an iPhone, you buy your iPhone and they just do overnight shipping and that's it. And, okay. uh, and everyone gets it on launch day. So this, this was very different. Yeah, I, and and folks, if we sound like we're a bunch of spoiled brats, maybe we it's are. It's because we are. Yeah, but, but but having said that, you know, I guess it was just it was a matter of setting the expectations. And Apple's done a great job up to this point of setting expectations farther out that you might get it, let's say, November fifth, and it shows up on October thirtieth. And so that may be the reason that a lot of people didn't pay for some of the expedited shipping, um, or. You know, just had had a different set of expectations. It just seemed really strange that we would have this with this particular device when it seemed like the supply was great because the Apple stores had them. There were even some non-Apple stores that, that carry Apple TVs that had them as well. I think there were some Best Buys that got them. Mm -hmm. So it just, it just came across very strange and, and different. And I, I, hope it's, I hope it was just an aberration somewhere and not uh, important of things to come. Well, it's also well, a little maybe different it, for us because uh, we, we discuss these things for a living. So, you know, we, we kind of need to have them as soon as possible. It's a little different than just, you know, wanting the latest, greatest toy. We actually need to be able to talk about the thing. True. So, you know, it, it, it's more of a professional thing for us. Yeah. Thank you for the excuse, Josh. That We, <laughs> we all appreciate it. I was going to say, it doesn't work for me because I don't do this professionally. Poo. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, never mind. Well, but I was going to say, yes, in my daily Linux sysadmin job, needing an Apple TV, no, I can't make that work. Yeah. <laughs> well, we think of you as a professional board. You had to see if you could install Linux on the new Apple TV. That's... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure someone somewhere on the internet has. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, however we got it, whenever we got it, we got our Apple TVs. And I'm anxious to hear first off what you thought about the the initial physical device and also the setup process. Um, it would, Bart, I'm going to Josh. I want to skip you because you've had yours for a month, so you don't count. So, <laughs> <laughs> Bart, how about you? Uh, from, describe the okay. setup process and how well you thought it how it worked. Well, I guess the, the first thing you mentioned was the physical device. So I open up the box, and what struck me is how bloody heavy it is. Like, it, it, does, it looks like it should weigh nothing, and you pick it up, and it weighs a ton. And I was like, wow, that's very heavy. And then I realized there is no power block. So now I understand why it's so heavy. It's full of power block. There's probably almost no Apple TV in there. It's like a power block and the insides of an iPhone, I guess. Uh, setting it up, because I didn't get to it till Tuesday because I was away on Monday, I had been listening to the podcast and everyone saying how awful the keyboard is and how terrible it is and blah, 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 blah. So I turned it on. It said, would you like to set it up manually or use a device? I said, use a device. It said, turn on Bluetooth and put your phone next to your Apple TV. I did. The phone said, would you like to set it up? I said, yes. It said, send in your password. On the phone, I put in my iTunes password and that was it. It was done. It was finished. I was like, what's the fuss about? This is perfect. Yeah. Um. Jeff, how about how about you? Similar experience or any hiccups? The uh, the initial setup, taking it out of the box, all of that. It was the experience I expect from Apple, and the initial setup was awesome. And when it when uh, went, so I'm sitting there and I'm caressing the new remote because I I I love that new remote, and uh, I'm I'm just caressing this thing. I'm like, oh, beautiful remote, beautiful remote. I love you. And uh, then I see on the screen it says, hey, use another device to set this up. And sure, use my iPhone, and it was done. I thought, wow, that was great. Then I hit the part where I'm like, worst keyboard ever. It's because I went and downloaded Netflix and and uh, and YouTube and Vimeo and these other apps where I have accounts where I have to log in. And at that point, putting in my email address and these various passwords that one password has created for me that, that are just like crazy – that was an ordeal with the Apple remote. And, well, not so much the Apple remote, but with the on-screen keyboard. That, so I get why people were upset about the on-screen keyboard, because if you had to enter a bunch of weird passwords, it's just horrible for that. I disagree so, so much. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and see, 
you're not the only person I've heard say that. And so at first I was thinking, what was Apple thinking? How could they possibly think this was, was a reasonable way to set up a keyboard? And I've had several people tell me this is so much better. So what, what I get from that is that Apple did a lot of testing and found that this is actually a preferable keyboard for many people and probably for the majority of their target audience. And the rest of us are, uh, from Apple's perspective, just like whiny pundits that, that need to <laughs> suck it up and use the right keyboard. <laughs> well, I, for me, I, I hated nothing more than the grid on the Apple TV because I have been sorting things alphabetically my entire life. I have never 2D alphabetic sorted anything, so it's not in any way natural. It's click, 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 click. Whereas this swipe, if I swipe fast, I go really, you know, I go far through the alphabet. If I swipe gently, I go a little bit through the alphabet. I know instinctively what direction every letter is from every other letter because I've been alphabetizing things all my life. Mm -hmm. And after I'd say two or three minutes, I was hitting them every, the right letter every time. I was just swipe, click, swipe, click, swipe, click. I, I never used such a nice on-screen keyboard because I was initially cranky that there's no Bluetooth keyboard support, and now I don't care so much. Josh, I still want Bluetooth keyboard support. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll take it. I'm not saying I don't want it, but... Josh, d jump in here because now this is one you've, you've had it for a while. So, how do you feel about it now that you're you're a month more experienced than the rest of us? Well, I still don't like the on-screen keyboard. Um, I find it really inefficient because with the grid and and mind you, I've been a gamer my whole life. So, you know, I grew up playing NES games where you had like a grid keyboard. You had to type your passwords in every time you wanted to load where you had saved your game. Uh, so maybe I'm just used to it. But to me, the grid keyboard is a lot more efficient because instead of having to scroll through every letter, you can you can take some shortcuts. You can jump through the grid. Um, but, you know, I've heard enough people uh, like you know, Bart defend uh, the, the linear keyboard. So, you know, I, I mean, I guess it's OK. You know, I, I think the bigger issue, though, is that there aren't alternatives supported um like in the in the uh, prior apple tv you know there's no remote app yet and, and whether there will be one or not it's kind of up in the air um there was a developer document um earlier on in the in the beta test they said oh well we're going to update the remote app to uh to uh, support the new apple tv and then a uh, word from jason snell on six colors uh he talked to someone from apple back in september and he says oh is, uh, are you guys going to update the remote app and Probably the guy from Apple just said, no, no, we're not going to do that. So who knows? Um, I would be – I mean, I'm, I'm kind of irritated with that too because I, I hate my Apple Watch and really the only thing I like it for is as a remote control from Apple TV. And I, it doesn't do that anymore. The one thing I liked about it, it doesn't do. Um, so I'm kind of irate about that. And also the Bluetooth keyboards because um, – that was just such a great feature. And, yeah, it was a geeky feature, but, you know, it was one of those things that, you know, it was just nice to have. But um, I could live without it if they would just update the remote app because it was so nice to be able to open one password, uh, copy a password, paste it in there. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and what Apple's reasoning is, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I've got theories, but it's all just kind of throwing spaghetti to the wall at this point. But given that this is this is basically iOS, is basically OS X, it's the same kernel in all of these OSs, Bluetooth keyboard had to be in, it had to have taken effort to take Bluetooth keyboard out of that OS. My theory, and this is the theory I'm sticking with until I hear otherwise, is that Apple didn't want uh, smart aleck developers trying to port things like uh, like text editors and stuff to the Apple TV. They don't want productivity apps on this thing. And, and they, I think the thought process was, well, if we support keyboards, someone's going to try to do that. And then they're, they're going to whine to the press and ask, why not? And we just don't want that on the TV. That's the best theory I can come up with. I think you're right. I, th I think there's some validity to that. I think the panel is going to split here 50-50 because I'm with Bart. I, I've, especially since this was not the old Apple remote, it was the, the new trackpad remote. That you know, slide across. I I've, I didn't quite develop the dexterity Bart did, but it's like okay, I, I I I just need to go a little farther. So I just I don't have to click. I just move my my finger, or I need to go the whole way over there. So slide it over and it goes. Um, so I I didn't I found it I I didn't find it to be more uh, bad. You know I I think it would have been nice if we could have done what you're talking about with with a Bluetooth keyboard. Or, or even an iOS app that would have paired with it that you could you know then enter them in with that keyboard, but for what it is, no, I, I'm, I'm with Bart. 
Well, you, the other you, thing they could do is touch ID on the bloody remote, and then I wouldn't care what the keyboard was like. No, that's true, too. Uh, here, here's a tip. If you really hate the linear keyboard that much, if you unpair the Siri remote and you uh, hook up uh, an infrared remote like the old Apple remote, it will show the old grid-style keyboard if the Siri remote's unpaired. Really? Now, now, how strange is that? <laughs> yeah. well, if you think about it, though, Imagine using the 26 long straight line with a click, 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 click oh, remote. Yeah, I think you'd go insane. That'd yeah. be, that'd be yes, awful. you would. Yeah. And, and I've gotten used to the linear keyboard. Um, uh, th there is one little trick that, that makes it easier. If you, like, if you need to mix case, like you're typing a password, if you highlight a character and you, uh, you highlight a letter and you hold down uh, the track, the, the touchpad, it will have a little pop up like the alternate character selection, and you can select the uppercase letter from there, and you can also backspace one character from there, too. So if you make a mistake, cool. if you need to type an uppercase character, that will save you a lot of time. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com slash macvoices for a special offer for Mac Voices viewers and listeners. Drobo is back as a sponsor of Mac Voices, and it's perfect timing. The Drobo team are longtime members of the Mac Voices family, and I'm a longtime fan of theirs. Drobo is built on a few simple but important principles. First, digital data is central to our lives, and that's never been more true than now. Second, that Drobo's job was to keep that data safe. Hard drive failure is a key risk in this scenario. There are others, and we'll talk about them later. But for now, a failed hard drive is one of the fastest ways to ruin your day, or week, or more. Third, drive capacity expansion should be simple. If you need more storage, add a drive or remove a small drive and replace it with a larger one. No tools, no procedures, not even a power down. Just do it. Sort of like a printer cartridge. If you need more ink, take out the old, replace it with the new. Only Drobo is even easier than that. Fourth, simplicity of use. Not a lot of technical decisions, not a lot of menus or meters or things to try to understand. Just simple storage that communicates with a red, green, and yellow light system. If you can understand a traffic light, you can use a Drobo. Those are the key principles behind Drobo, and they're part of every Drobo product. I can and will give you many reasons to get and rely on a Drobo. But for now, it's most important that you understand that you, me, anyone can understand and use a Drobo to protect their data. That your data is safe, even if a hard drive fails. That your data is safe, even if two hard drives fail. That you can expand the storage in a Drobo when you need to by adding or replacing a drive. No procedures, no incantations. Just slide out one drive, slide another one in, and keep going. In a world where we're all taking more and more digital photos, creating more and more videos, and doing more and more with our devices, Drobo delivers the ease of use and security you need. To give you just a short geek's peek at this, Drobo's Beyond Raid technology lets you start with just two drives in your Drobo. No, it doesn't have to be two matching drives either. Not in any sense. Not by size, not by manufacturer. Use whatever size or price drive meets your needs, and the Drobo automatically adapts to it, making sure your data is safe. No matter what your needs, there's a Drobo for you. And right now, you can get a $100 discount on the Drobo Mini, Drobo 4Bay, or Drobo 5N by visiting drobo.com slash macvoices and using the discount code VOICES100 when you order. That's VOICES100 for $100 off a Drobo Mini, Drobo 4Bay, or Drobo 5N. Drobo is my choice for safe, expandable storage, and it should be yours, too. Check it out now, and thanks to Drobo for their support of Mac Voices. So we, we split on the keyboard. So and, and the setup process sounds like everybody's was pretty bulletproof. Um, it was a very Apple-like experience, to quote Jeff. It's, we've already crossed over a little bit into the remote, but let's go there for a second. I love the remote. I love the way it feels in my hand. It took me a little, It's taking me a little while. I'm still not quite there yet to to pick it up and have my finger or my thumb realize that okay, I've, I'm holding it upside down. I need to get to the other surface. Got to remember which surface it is that that is the uh, 
is the trackpad service. But I, I absolutely, I absolutely love it. It, it took me. This is going to sound crazy, but it took me just a little while to remember. Yeah, this is a trackpad. I need to click it. It's like, okay, where's the button to click? I don't have a, I don't have a click. And then once I realized what I was doing, then you know, it, it's been super smooth. I, I absolutely love the, the this the uh, the the microphone button. Uh, this was a brilliant implementation of Siri because it eliminates all the questions of what's it listening to, when's it listening to it. Um, it's not going to take any commands that you don't want it to accidentally. Um, I, I just I I think it's fantastic. But that's me. Um, Josh, let's start with you this time. What what is your impression of of the Siri remote? Overall, I like it. Um, I do have some nitpicks with it. As you alluded to, it's a bit too symmetrical. So it sort of has the the iMac puck mouse problem where you don't always know which end is up. Um, the other issue I have with it is I keep clicking the dang Siri button by accident. I, I go to hit the, the menu button. And I guess if that was my biggest complaint is that there, are, if anything, there's a few – there's a too many buttons on it now and it's, it's harder to just know exactly what your thumb is on when you're not looking at it and maybe i'll eventually get used to that but i've had it for about a month now and i still haven't um quite got the hang of it um i do like the touchpad a lot though the um the remote app for the previous apple tv you know it has that had that trackpad kind of deal going on there and I never liked it much because i always overshot what i was aiming for it seemed like it always skipped two items at a time instead of just one. The new touchpad is actually quite sensitive and quite precise. Um, the uh, uh, the other thing I like about it is that um, the uh, the motion controls for games and stuff are also pretty good. And, but the thing that was most impressive to me was that when I you know first got the thing, you know, first got it set up and I aimed the Siri remote at my TV and I pressed the volume buttons, it instantly knew how to control my TV's volume. Uh, it didn't have to be trained how to do that. Now, I don't have, uh, my TV's a bit older. It doesn't have HDMI CEC, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more in a minute. But somehow, um, through HDMI or something else, it was able to program this remote to work with my TV out of the box. Now, I have a, a home theater receiver, so I ended up programming it control the volume there but still impressive and it also turns my tv on and off uh i didn't have to do any kind of setup for that either so um you know overall i, I like it i think it's an improvement over the old remote function wise uh a few nitpicks with it but you know yeah overall you know pretty solid product okay so we've got two thumbs up for the the remote um jeff you want to jump in on this you know i well i've already said that I immediately fell in love with the remote, and uh, and and that love affair has continued. I love the trackpad that's built into it, and it's surprisingly accurate for navigation. and uh, And I didn't have any trouble catching on that I actually needed to click because when I when I first put my thumb on that part of the remote and started moving around, all I thought was I'm using a trackpad. And so I, I used it exactly like any other trackpad, and I physically clicked on things, and, and that was great. And I and I love that it paired. Uh, it was programmed automatically for my television, which, like Josh's, is uh, is a few years old. So uh, I had no reason to expect that it would just work out of the box, but it was programmed and good to go. So that's awesome. I love that I hit the TV button on the remote. Apple TV turns on, my television turns on, my remote or my uh, volume buttons are right there. I have gone from having three remotes sitting in front of me all the time to just the Apple Siri remote. And I and I absolutely love that. So overall I've been really happy with it. Occasionally I will I will have it in my hand upside down, but I realize that very quickly when I go to hit the TV button and I'm actually pausing a show because at that point I'm hitting the play pause button. But that doesn't even happen very often for me. So either I get really lucky or there's something that's happening for me where, where I'm catching on to, to how the symmetrical remote actually needs to be held and getting it right most of the time. Bart, are you going to make it uh, four? Oh, yeah. Well, mostly. I won't say all good things. But uh, the, the trackpad is such a nice way to interact. You know, the whole swipe, click, swipe, click is such a step forward from 
you know, having to move your finger from the four arrow keys, for, for want of a better term, and then between the, you know, go in and go out buttons. Abs- that was absolutely horrible. This is very intuitive, very nice, very pleasant. And this, I, I think probably the nicest thing that makes me the happiest is when you're 20 million menus deep in Netflix, you hit the TV button and you're straight out. None of this back up, back up, back up, back up, back up, like I always had to do with the old Apple TV. Mm-hmm. So where I think it goes down a bit is the ergonomics of the thing are really not very good. It doesn't fit in the hand. It's a slab of metal that you just sort of hold and accept. It's the wrong thickness. It's the wrong shape. It, it doesn't sit in the hand. It's just a slab of metal. But the actual interactions are, are very, very, very good. So I like it. I just wish the shape of the bottom was different so it actually sat in the hand properly. I'm, I'm really intrigued that none of you mentioned the, the, the voice control. I was the only one that brought it up, and I did it in passing just to see what happened. And, oh, I and, assumed you were going to get to Siri voice control later. Oh, okay. Yeah, same here. Okay, all right. Well, then I, then let's do it. Um, th- that, that, to me, has been one of the highlights because now I just I, I hold the button down. I say Plex. I don't have to go and search for the app. Nothing. It just pops up and goes. I mean, it's, it, it's wonderful. So if I know something is on my Apple TV, it, 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 it launches it. It's, it's phenomenal. I just want to cry. Why? Siri on my Apple TV. She she's not the Siri from my iPhone where where she's my sweet good friend that helps me out with things. On my Apple TV, she's she's this clerk that has no interest in in actually giving me anything that's useful. And and I'm finding this very surprising. And okay, so so my 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 dysfunctional relationship series with series started the first time I wanted to watch the current episode of Doctor Who. And I, I watched Doctor Who by, by getting an iTunes subscription and, uh, and, and just getting all the seasons that way because I'm a cord cutter. So I have eight seasons and now several episodes into season nine because that's where we are, Doctor Who. And uh, so I wanted to watch the current episode of Doctor Who. And so I pick up the remote, I hit the button, and I said, show me the current episode of Doctor Who. And what it does is it takes me to the collection of everything I have for Doctor Who and puts me on episode one, season one. So, so I'm seeing Christopher Eccleston in, instead of, of uh, uh, ha, I just forgot the new Doctor's name. Uh, Capaldi. Thank you. And... Uh, and what I ended up having to do, I tried several things and couldn't get Siri to give me the current episode of the show. I tried several different ways of phrasing it. So what, I, what you have to do is scroll sideways through nine seasons of shows to get to the current one. And I tried this with, uh, with a couple other series that I have subscriptions to, and it was the same thing. Siri would get me to the, the first episode of a, of a of a series, but would not get me to the current episode of a series. And I had to swipe and swipe and swipe and swipe and swipe to get to it. And if there, if there are words that I need to string together so that I have the right incantation to be able to actually watch the show that I really want to see, please tell me what those words are so that I can recite them to my television. Well, I, I just tried, uh, asking siri on the actually on my apple tv on my desk here and i just asked it to show me the list of episode of doctor who and it actually managed to pull it right up is it uh season nine episode seven invasion of the zygons that it is it managed to pull that right up but i i, I know it's very <laughs> it's very inconsistent though it's very inconsistent i've had this problem um you know for instance the other night uh, it was halloween the other night i want to watch a horror movie i knew the reanimators on netflix um so I tried to search for it in Siri, and Siri could not figure out what I was saying. It was like I was speaking, you know, Danish or something. Um, and sometimes it, Siri just just kind of flips out. And it seems like Siri on the Apple TV is just, just kind of stupid compared to uh, yes. the iPhone version. Um, and, and well, for uh, another example is that um, and Neelai Patel mentioned this in the Verge review. It wasn't until like I think the day of release, you know, like the the day before when there's the apps, we had the app store and all that. I tried searching for Game of Thrones, you know, one of the top shows in, in the iTunes store. I had no idea what I was talking about. I might as well have asked for I don't know. I might as well have just been speaking Chinese. I had no idea what I was talking about, and so it's one of those things. It's fantastic when it works, um, 
you know, like you search for a movie and then you can pull it up on HBO Go or whatever now. And that's that's terrific when it works. But then sometimes it just kind of flakes out on you and it leaves you scratching your head. So I have sort of mixed feelings about Siri and Apple TV. And I'm sure it'll get better, but uh, right now it's it's kind of inconsistent and unreliable. Yes. Jeff, have you tried um, – and, and I, Josh, I don't know what your incantation was that got to it, but if you said Doctor Who Season 9, Episode 7. No, I, I said show me the – I'll do it now just to make sure. Show me the latest episode of Doctor Who. Yeah, and then, uh, then the little dingus on the bottom pops up, Season 9, Episode 7, and I click that, and then it takes me to uh, the current season and highlights that episode. Hmm. Oh, see, that would be awesome. <laughs> what, what I got was what, what I described, just the listing of all the episodes in a single long line. The other thing that would happen is is uh, is my Apple TV would then want me to go download the Hulu app so that I could watch a documentary about like season seven of Doctor Who or something. And I'm like, I'm actually in the section where I can see all the Doctor Who episodes when I'm asking you this. And you're telling me that you want me to go get Hulu and do something else instead and go home, Siri, you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Bart, do you have anything to add? To I, this? <laughs> uh, not very much because it never even occurred to me to push the microphone button because I don't like talking to myself in the sitting room. Uh, I just find that really weird. I, I've, the watch has gotten me slightly over my not liking to talk to myself thing because if I'm cooking and my hands are dirty, I'll just talk to my watch. And it actually surprises me by doing stuff, which I, I think I hadn't actually used Siri in about three years because I, I just not my thing. And when the watch does what I tell it, I am perpetually amazed. So maybe I'll give it a go. But bear in mind, over here in Ireland, there are no TV shows from Apple. There is no HBO, none of that stuff. So at the moment, the only thing that Siri can search for me is Netflix. And most of my media is not in Netflix. So may, maybe that when we get universal search, when it's in every app, it's probably going to become way more useful outside the U.S. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by lynda.com, the unparalleled online training library. Get a full free 10-day trial at lynda.com slash macvoices. There are lots of great things about lynda.com. Things like their constant addition to their amazing collection of video tutorials, with a total of just under 4,000 titles. Of course, it will probably be more than 4,000 by the time you hear this. Things like their series that bring you shorter form, new tips on a regular basis on topics such as design and video gear. Things like their articles, because lynda.com doesn't just do video. Things like their iOS app that lets you download courses for offline viewing. It's amazing just how much learning you can do while the guy in the center seat is wasting his time watching TV reruns on the plane's video system. Things like the fact that you have access to a broad spectrum of topics, from business to photography, software development to education. Things like the fact that you get the kind of training that gets you up to speed on a new topic, or in-depth training that gives you expert-level expertise. Things like the roster of amazing instructors who aren't just lynda.com authors, but who work in the fields they teach in. So they aren't just reading from a manual, but they have lived the topic. Things like the fact that you can try lynda.com free for a full 10 days by visiting lynda.com slash macvoices. That 10 days includes everything, not just the articles and not just the series. Every single video course is at your beck and call for 240 hours by visiting lynda.com slash macvoices. You can watch as much as you want to in those first 10 days, and then sign up to keep learning. It's going to be a long, long time before you run out of things to watch. One more time, lynda.com slash macvoices for your free 10-day trial. Use that URL to let lynda.com know that you appreciate their support of Mac Voices, just like I do. Thanks to lynda.com for supporting this week's edition of Mac Voices. I admit, I, Jeff, I haven't tried what you tried. Um, you know, I, I, I was, I guess, more enamored with the idea of being able to launch apps uh, verbally as opposed to. Now, I did do a search on Star Trek. You know, show me Star Trek, and you know, bang, everything popped up. But of course, you're right; it, it did show everything. Um, but I was so pleased with that, and, and was. I wanted to get on to actually using it that I didn't do any more testing, and I probably should have. 
that, that'll come later after the newness wears off. Um, so okay, so it sounds like Siri is is a bit of a mixed bag uh, on the Apple TV. Maybe maybe it's drunk, maybe it's uh, you know unintelligent quirk. I don't know. Some interesting dis descriptions here. Um, so let's move on to just talking about the interface overall. Uh, how do you all feel about it? Is it for my money? It's it's gorgeous. Um, I and I think especially with the Siri remote to move around the interface, it just feels a lot more logical and a lot smoother than the previous Apple TV. Bart, um, how about if I give you first shot at this one? Yeah, on, on the whole, it works very, very well. And the fact that they don't preload the bloody television with all those apps I just spent all my time going in and deleting every week when new ones showed up, that was really nice. It's just the bare basics, the App Store, I was actually very pleased. Like, the App Store is very pretty. And the search, actually, a lot of the stuff is actually really nice when you find it in the search and stuff. But the fact that I could download apps that belong to, I presume they were because I own the iOS apps or something, I was able to download stuff just by clicking install instead of clicking buy, which was... I didn't expect that. I'm not quite sure why that happened. Um, no, I have no complaints about the interface. It's yeah, it, it just works. It, it's it's not particularly pretty. It's not all ornamented. It 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 just works. Yeah, I, I had the same experience when I went to the purchase section expecting it to be empty. There were mm -hmm. things there that I, I was surprised. And yeah, you still had to download. You know, hit the hit the install. Um, but I have no idea where they came from or why. Josh, you look like you're raising your hand. Do you know? <laughs> because uh, so, uh, Apple allows developers to set um, iOS apps as universal buy. Um, of course, mm -hmm. as you know, for on the iPhone and iPad, they can have universal binaries. But um, tvOS apps, you know, aren't the same binary as the iOS. But they can do what's what's called universal buy. So if you buy the uh, the iPhone or iPad version then you get the um, TV version for free. And it's kind of confusing uh -huh. because not all apps do that. Um, so uh, if, if you want to see, uh, when you get your Apple TV, if you have your Apple TV now, if you go to the App Store and go to the Purchase tab and you look in there, then you can see uh, all the apps that you know have, are registered with the TV already that you can go ahead and download for free, um, which is a, you know, a, go a good thing to check when you first set it up. Um, <clears throat> But uh, yeah, so that, that's why that happens. That's why you already have some apps that are already uh, showing as purchased because the, the developers enabled that universal buy. I noticed it was mostly free apps that had that. Um, Which makes sense. Yeah. It does yeah. make sense. I mean, and it's really in, in Google's interest to have YouTube just there for people. Sure. Especially because we're used to having it on the old Apple TV. So the fact that, that was really easy to get to was very clever on their part. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really found a rhyme or reason to which apps are universal buy and which ones aren't. I don't think developers really have a sense yet. You know, for instance, um, if you get pCalc, yes, pCalc is on the Apple TV. That's an extra $1.99 uh, to buy that if you're already on the iOS version. But if you say um, own uh, the game Oceanhorn, that's a $10 game, and it's free on the TV if you already have the iOS version. Um, so, you know, this is one of those things. Uh, it's up to the developer. It's entirely depending on the app. Jeff, um, how about you with the interface? Uh, happy, unhappy, drunk? <laughs> Overall, I'm, I'm very pleased with the interface. I do prefer it to the old Apple TV interface. The one place where it falls down for me is, well, it's, it goes back to when you have a lot of shows and, uh, and you go to look at that listing, instead of having a nice list of, or a grid or something, in, in my case, it's like a hundred and something episodes of Doctor Who all in a single row. And, uh, and, and there's, some, there's some rendering issues there too. Like when you get to the end of one season and the beginning of the other, you'll have two episode names side by side, but the text overlaps. And then season two or season three or whatever, that text is on top of that as well. So you have like three sets of words all jumbled on top of each other. So, that, but you know, stuff like that, with the text, that's that's an easier fix. As far as as actually scrolling through a lot of of shows through Apple's own interface, I I do think they need to rethink that. Some uh, other apps like the Netflix app, it's you know it's easy to to scroll through their content because they're they're giving you an interface that that's more familiar, where where you're kind of drilling down and then you have a list of episodes. I've I was working with the Plex app earlier. Um, 
I, last night I was trying to get it up and running, and unfortunately, the Apple TV kept telling me that the the Plex application on my Drobo 5N needed an update. And I was having trouble getting it updated, but before the show, it, it, it finally popped up, and I started you know, being able to see things from the 5N on on the Apple TV, and so it looks like it's going to function just just fine, which is exactly what I would, I would expect from all three devices, the Apple TV, the Drobo 5N, and Plex. That, to me, is going to be a huge thing because I have a very significant library of, um, of videos and Apple, or excuse me, and TV shows that I've stored there, and... I, I love the idea that now I will wherever that Apple TV is, or and boy, that brings up another question of how many Apple TVs do we upgrade? Um, <laughs> but you know, now I can have all that stuff right there, and not have to jump through any of the hacks or hoops or anything, use any other boxes. That I'll just have access to that on top of everything that's on YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, one thing I was surprised about um, with the new Apple TV is how much it hasn't changed really i mean once you get past the cool parallax icons that i can't stop uh rubbing my finger over on the on the trackpad and watching the blood move around but i mean other than that it's it's basically the exact same interface uh, as you know the second generation apple tv it just it just hasn't changed much and and so much of the software you know, and I like the familiarity. I'm sure a lot of users appreciate it, but I can't help but feel like the whole thing is kind of rushed. You know, and, and when you pointed that out, Jeff, that you know the overlapping text when you're looking at your TV shows, I, I had to go check that because I hadn't seen that yet. And yeah, it was. I saw the exact same thing you do, where the the headers overlap each other, where they, they and, mm -hmm. and that's such an unApple like thing to do. I mean, Apple is is, is so anal retentive about typography and text. I, I can't imagine right. how. They just let that slide out. And for something that – for a device that Apple has apparently been working on for just years and years. I mean we first heard you know, Steve Jobs crack TV what, back in the, in the Steve Jobs book that came out in 2011. For something mm -hmm. that they, they've been working on for at least four years or more, this thing sure does feel like they kind of slapped it together over a summer. Well, it's, yeah. The search API is key to the whole – you know, apps are the future. That's the message of this device, and it's a really good message. But not having the search API ready on day one that underlines that undermines that message to the point that it, you're right. It it feels like we needed to get this out for some reason. I don't understand. Instead of waiting six months, well, I guess Christmas is the reason. But it feels like it's half a year away from being finished. You know, you know the search API I can kind of understand because Apple's kind of stingy with those. But there's even more basic stuff that leaves me scratching in my head. You know, for instance, we were just talking about Siri search, but we didn't talk about how Siri can't search Apple Music. Uh, <laughs> right, that isn't coming till next yeah. year. Yeah, 2016. I mean, what, and Apple is trying is pushing Apple Music so hard. So it's it's just baffling why they would leave that out, and and, and that would seem like. They would already have the code for that. I mean, the code for that's in iOS nine as is. Uh, I, I'm just not sure why that doesn't work yet. I, I've got to. I'll, I'll play devil's advocate like I always do. Is there any possibility that some of these features and, and the typography thing? Yeah, you're right. You know, I can I can think of some very good reasons why that's happening, but it does seem a bit unApple like. Is there any chance that some of these other features features? Uh, are are we're being held back a little bit are not fully implemented to get us up and running with with the unit and not have us uh, give us a chance to learn it a little bit learn about Siri search learn about some of these other things as opposed to just throwing everything because it, I mean if, if if I hit the button and say Rolling Stones I mean first of all I'm going to be inundated on video and if you throw then audio in the mix as well you know I, I might never get back so is is that that sounds you know like i don't know maybe i'm making excuses maybe i'm just trying to understand that there could be a logic here to rolling out some of this stuff just a little bit at a time i i think that's a bit of a stretch now when it comes to the remote app and possibly even bluetooth keyboard support i could see why maybe they intentionally held those back so they could see how people adapt to the Siri remote, how they adapt to using Siri on the Apple TV. Maybe they need more data for Siri, and so they don't want people going and having a good a good keyboard yet that they're just going to type on and just skip Siri entirely. Um, you know, Maybe they need to sell people on Siri, like, hey, we need, we need to make it so that you have to use this and everything else is highly unpleasant. Um, 
but yeah, I mean the yeah, the Apple Music thing. Uh, that's I just I, it makes the, it makes that feel rushed to me because I just can't see why they would leave that out. Because when you pull up the search screen, you search for anything, it you know it has categories for stuff, apps and music, TV shows, blah 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 blah. I mean, they could just have another row for music, and I don't think that would confuse anything. I I think yeah, you, you totally nailed it. It's. I think that we don't have the music support, not because Apple is trying to to ease us in to uh, all these search results, but there's something that's fundamentally broken, and they couldn't include the include music search because it did not work. So they they just shut it off and uh, and they'll turn it on in uh, what they're saying is early 2016. Once they get it fixed, and then everyone will be really glad that that it's there, and we'll complain for like a week or so about it's so lame we didn't have it in the beginning, and then no one will say anything else about it, and we'll just be glad we have it. That's that's a perfect segue into a point that I want to make because it's I, I too like like Bart. I've been listening to a lot of different shows, a lot of different people that like Josh each either had it for a while or you know got it the first day. Um. We, we all tend to have a tendency to think that this should be a fully fully functioning, fully developed product on day one. That and seems like a reasonable expectation. <laughs> uh, thanks. This isn't Google. No, it's it's not it's Google. It's fully developed and it's fully developed, though, right? Well, y- yeah. Like the iPhone. The first iPhone, it worked. It, it didn't feel unfinished, even though it was missing cut, copy, paste. It didn't feel rushed. It it yeah, did it, what it, it, it was well. a complete device. Yes. Okay. It just didn't do everything, but what it did, it did well. Whereas in this case, you know, the the whole ethos of this thing is: what does this give me over the existing Apple TV apps? Apps are key. Apps are everything, and apps don't feel all that well integrated into this thing yet. That doesn't seem well thought out. That doesn't seem like it's finished. You mean apps from the standpoint of how you how how you get them? Yeah. Or? I mean, the whole point of this is single search. Everything is in apps. The future isn't cable subscriptions, the future is apps. This isn't it yet, even though that's what they stood up on stage and promised us. To, to Bart's point, it wasn't until the other day that the App Store and the Apple TV even had top lists. And it wasn't until yes. um, yesterday, I think it was, where they had categories. Even now, they only have two categories, games and entertainment. That, that's it. <laughs> Which is kind, that, of, kind of redundant to me. It's right. broad. <laughs> well, it definitely tells you what Apple's focus is, and it definitely yes. says they don't want Excel on this thing. Um, <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> I would you probably that, hope Chuck, to use but that. I was recording a podcast with you earlier. I would have liked to have my show notes up on the telly. Yeah, I use for that. I would love a okay. Keynote app for the Apple TV. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll go with browser. I'll go with you on that. <laughs> Something that I am absolutely, I, I am absolutely unqualified because it's not installed on my Apple TV, nor will it be. Uh, in all likelihood, is is any games, any any gamers among the three of you? And if if so, what's your experience been? I knew Josh would raise his hand. Uh, <laughs> Josh, you I, first, or Jeff? I, I don't care who. No, uh, go with Josh because Josh, you are a much more serious gamer than I. So so you can talk about the serious gamer aspect, and then I'll talk about the casual gamer aspect. How does that sound? Okay, sure. Although I'm not as serious as I used to be, I've been out of the game for <laughs> no pun intended. I've been out of the game for a while with the toddler, but um, I do have a PS4 with Battlefront on on order. That's that's coming soon. But see, I couldn't get it sooner because I wanted to play with the Apple TV. I know how I work. I would have just been ignoring the Apple TV here. So I've downloaded a lot of games for the Apple TV, and I'll, and the, the developer kit I have is only th- only 32 gigabytes. And it's handling that pretty well. You never run out of space because it's always um, purging old stuff and downloading new stuff. So if you have a good internet connection, and I do, I pay for Comcast Business, so I get 50 megabits a second down, and I don't have any bandwidth caps. So um, you know that's pretty nice. If you have DSL, uh, this may not be the device for you. But um, I, I've been playing a lot of stuff, and uh, I overall, it's a pretty, it's a surprisingly good experience. Um, now the problem with the Siri remote is that uh, the buttons on it, you can only use a handful of these in the actual game. You can click the touchpad, you can press play, pause to do stuff. Um, menu can kind of act as a, um, a pause button or like a, like a menu button in the game. And then you can you know rotate it, you have motion control, and that's it. 
So it's it's very limited. It's it's like an old school Nintendo Entertainment System in that regard. You only have just very few buttons, but a number of games work surprisingly well. Um, my my two favorites so far are uh, Ocean Horn, which I mentioned earlier. Which Ocean Horn is kind of a clone slash ripoff of Nintendo's Legend of Zelda series, and it, it works amazingly well for a game that's been condensed into you controlling it only with a trackpad and by clicking the trackpad. You know, you go around, you open doors, you collect keys, you kill monsters, you get treasures, and it all works surprisingly well with just one button and a, and a touchpad. Um, the other game I like, and I can't stop playing this, in fact, I may have a hard time even getting into my PS4 because I keep playing it so much, but um, Game Loft's Asphalt 8, which is a, a racing game. It's, if we're being honest, a ripoff of the Need for Speed series. Um, it's a very, very much a Fast and Furious kind of game where you know you, you you drive real cars, but you do ridiculous things like jump off ramps and crash other cars and things like that. And it is so much fun. And it it syncs cloud it syncs saves via iCloud to the iPhone version, so you can play it on the go. Um, it can it super the controls are super responsive. And as someone who you know, I have a Wii and a Wii U, and I can't stand playing the Mario Kart games with the Wii controller, you know, wobbling it back and forth. But it works perfectly with this game, and, and I, I'm quite good at it if I do say my say so myself. Um, so I've had a lot of fun with that. And um, there are some other games I really like a lot. Xenowork, there is a uh, Apple TV version of that, which if you ever played it, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of an arcade version of Aliens. You go around and, you know, you're shooting at aliens and things. Um, and all these games, uh, for the most part, there's a couple of exceptions I won't get into here because um, these are early days and people are still working out the kinks. But for the most part, uh, it works surprisingly well as a gaming device. I mean, you'll never play something like Star Wars Battlefront or Destiny or Fallout 4 on the Apple TV um, because all games have to be compatible with this controller. You know, you can't just make a game and design it exclusively for, you know, say, the Steel Series Nimbus. But... Uh, so you're not going to get those kind of hard, real hardcore games. But you know, for a cat, for a media box that also does gaming, you know, compared to the Fire TV or the Roku or um, oh, what's the other one? The one that was the big Kickstarter thing and it just went nowhere. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it doesn't matter because no one has one anyway. Or if they do, it's in a closet. But compared <laughs> to any of those other boxes, it, it's a pretty good, you know, casual gaming box and. It, you know, it reminds me in a lot of ways of that old NES, you know, and it has these kind of simplified games that anyone can play, and, and they're pretty fun. Um, you know, so, yeah, it won't replace your PlayStation, but, you know, it, it is what it is, and what it is is pretty good. Jeff, you're, you're the casual gamer. All right, so to, so to set the bar for how casual I am, the gaming console I have is a Wii, and... The, and the games that I love playing on there, when, when I get outside of the, uh, you know, the, the Wii Fitness games, Lego Star Wars, Lego Batman, and that's it. So uh, they're, oh, yeah, they're <laughs> awesome. And you can't lose. You can die a hundred times in a row. And they're like, okay, here you go. Go again. <laughs> and, and see, and that's part of what, what I really enjoy about, about the Lego games. It's because you don't really die. You just hit a point where you have to go back a little bit and, uh, and work your way through again. And, uh, and, and they're just fun, fun games. But uh, I, it's not like I sit and just intensely play games for hours on end. I mean, I go at times uh, a few weeks without playing anything. And then, and then maybe I'll play for 20 minutes or an hour, or if I'm really crazy, two hours. So, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm very casual and I've been considering getting a Wii U so that, uh, that I could like maybe start playing Lego dimensions. I'll sell you one. Well, we may have to talk, um, but here's the thing: I'm I'm holding off because I want to see what happens when the Lego games come to Apple TV. Now, I'm just assuming this is going to happen, and if the Lego games come to Apple TV, then I'll probably just rebuy them for for Apple TV, assuming I have to rebuy them, and uh, and call it good. And I may not need any other gaming console. And I've been really surprised with how well 
the Siri remote works for playing games. And, and the game that, that I'm just loving on my Apple TV right now is Lumino City. I mean, it's a beautiful game on the iPhone. It's more beautiful on the iPad. And when you put it on a big screen TV and play it there just as a native game, it's absolutely wonderful. It's, it's, it's just flat out eye candy. And no, it's not a hard game. It's, you know, it's just some simple puzzles and, uh, and beautiful artwork. And that's it. But man, am I loving that game. So Josh, I'm with you. I think this is a great casual gaming machine and I don't expect to see like incredibly serious games on here. You know, what we, what we might, might be kind of interesting is if, uh, if cyan ported mist to, uh, to Apple TV, because yeah. you could totally do mist on Apple TV and it would look beautiful on, on a, on a big screen. Yeah, there, there's a lot of potential. You know, I was just thinking, you know, Aspire ported Knights of the Old Republic to iPad and iPhone. I was thinking, well, why couldn't they port to Apple TV? It's it's mostly a menu-driven game. I don't see any reason why they couldn't. So, you know, there, there is yeah. an opportunity for more hardcore games here. Um, speaking of puzzlers, I think probably the best-looking Apple TV game so far is uh, and it was an Apple Design Award winner. It's um, called Shadowmatic, and it is universal buy. So if you bought it for your iPhone, you have it on your Apple TV. And the whole idea behind this game is they they put a floating chunk of metal on the screen, and there's a light behind it, and you try to form, you, you try to move the piece of metal oh, right. around and make and make stuff with the shadows, like elephants and giraffes and things. And and it's, it's it, it sounds kind of boring, but it's the graphics are so good and it's so well done because. Um, it, on the iPhone and iPad, there's like a parallax effect when you move the. There's like a 3D mm -hmm. effect when you move the the iPhone or iPad around. So it, it kind of gives you that sense of 3Dness. Well, it does on the Apple TV too. As you move the remote around, it it's, it kind of shifts the the screen. So it, it's one of those. It, it's a perfect Apple kind of game because it's so simple, but yeah, it, it, it's so detailed and it's it's so detail oriented. Unlike uh, certain aspects of TV OS, <laughs> as we found. Bart, I feel like I've been completely left out of the last few minutes of this conversation because I don't even know these games, let alone any games. Well, and there was one thing in that conversation I picked up because I'm not really big into gaming. The one exception being the Lego games. So the whole thought of them coming to the TV has really made me prick up because they're such good fun. Yeah, other than that, I generally just play like weird, silly weird games. I think I'm the only person left playing Letterpress every day. <laughs> well, there I, must be at least one other person so that you can play against them, right? I That's true. Like, there's myself and a friend who play each other all the time. Every time we one of us wins, the other one starts a new game again. And uh, Adam Christensen still owes me a turn. But other than that, no, there's no one left. <laughs> so I need to play it again because I kind of got my start, my writing career kicked off by writing an, a strategy article about letterpress. And to this day, someone will occasionally ask me, hey, you want to play letterpress? So I'm like... Honestly, I stopped playing it after I wrote the article because I, I have this thing. Once I write about something and I've made it professional, I don't really want to touch it anymore. I, it's just a weird thing I have. And so I've been playing it in years, but every now and then someone will say, hey, you want to play Letterpress? <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't think I even know how to play anymore. <laughs> All right. So, so Josh, <laughs> never write an article about your wife, okay? That, right, right. <laughs> Moving on, because um, I'm, I'm really afraid of where Jeff might take us with that. Good life advice. Here. Um, we, we're, we are almost out of time, guys. So I'm going to ask, the, the, I think, what is the obvious question here? Um, is this a device that you can advocate for people to buy at this point? Um, the holidays are coming, so you would think it would be at the top of a lot of people's wish lists. Should it be? Bart, let's start with you. Well, I think it very much depends on what you want out of it. What I wanted out of this was a way to get all of the files on my Linux file server onto my telly without having to go through my iPhone and AirPlay. It works absolutely perfectly. Air Video HD is in the App Store today. It's €3.99. Euro. It works really well. So as far as I'm concerned, from my use case, this is a superb device. But if it doesn't do what you want, I could, you know, I would say to people, what do you want it for based on what you want it for, yes or no? Given that the hardware is going to be good for a while, maybe it's okay to buy it now on the expectation that software updates will make it do what it doesn't do yet. So I, all in all, I think value for money, I like it. I, I, I don't regret for a second buying it, and I think a lot of people would feel the same. You know, if uh, 
I, I'm okay recommending people get this because I think overall it is a better experience than the second and third generation Apple TV. If you're really, really happy with your, your third gen Apple TV right now, then maybe wait until spring when Apple's rolled out a bunch of updates and and the rough edges that we're complaining about right now have been taken care of. But, I mean, if you want to go get one today, I can't think of a good reason to tell someone, don't go buy the new Apple TV. I mean, it didn't take me much more than a few minutes after setting it up to know that I didn't want to reconnect my, my third gen Apple TV again. I was done with it. That's well said. Josh, I left you to third since you've had the most experience with the device and you know it better than any of us. Uh, recommend, not recommend? My advice would be pretty close to Jeff's. You know, uh, I would say if you have a box, whether it's a third gen Apple TV or, or otherwise, maybe a Fire TV, whatnot, and you're happy with it, um, it won't hurt your weight a little bit. Um, if you've just been if you've been holding off on buying an Apple TV, maybe you have an older Apple TV, or you don't have a box at all, or if you have um, a box from another company or something like that, and you've just been waiting, you know, until now to get the Apple TV, you know, go ahead and get it. There are some rough edges, but they're not atrocious. And one thing I do want to say about passwords: you don't have to enter a password every app. Some apps um, will do activation codes, and they'll show a code on your screen, and you'll go log into the site on your iPhone or something. And then you uh, you enter the activation code, and so you don't have to type on your Apple TV itself. So just depending on which apps you use, and this may be part of Apple's grand strategy too. Maybe they want more apps to do that sort of thing rather than have people type on the screen. Um, but yeah, I mean it's it's a very good device. I'm quite happy with it. Um, the apps are already blow, blow away what's available for the Apple Watch. If I'm being honest, um, at 150 bucks, you know, given Apple's price ranges uh, these days. Uh, I think it's well priced. I mean, you consider they're selling a trackpad for 130 bucks now. Uh, you know, yeah. So, you know, if you're shopping for an Apple Geek for, for Christmas, yes, this is make a fantastic present uh, for that person. Uh, you know, if if you've been waiting, yes, go ahead and get it. If uh, if you have something you're pretty happy with now, uh, you know, yeah, you can hold off a little bit. You know, um, you know, if, if you just don't like dealing with rough edges, you know, it won't hurt anything to hold off, but. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing majorly wrong with it. You know, we're we're nitpicking here. <laughs> and and I would have to say, it's, it's interesting what we all consider rough edges are, are some of the things that we've mentioned because my and admittedly limited experience. This is the first few days with the Apple TV folks. Um, I really haven't felt like I ran into too many of those rough edges. The roughest edge for me was that my Plex media server needed to be updated. That wasn't an Apple TV problem. That was the, the Plex media server problem. So, I, yeah, there, it just depends on what you consider rough edges. But I find the, the new Siri remote to be probably the standout aspect of this. The, the experience with that is, is so much better than the old Apple remote, Apple TV remote. Um, I really, and I just, I, I like that right up to the point where I got my hands on the Siri remote. And now it's like, oh, you know, I, do I really want to go back and pick up that cold little piece of, uh, of metal? So, yeah, I, I, I would definitely put it at the, at the top of the list. No question. Um, and, if, and again, but I think Jeff may have said it best. If it does what you want it to do or what you need it to do, do some research. And if that's the case, then go for it. Let's go around the room right quick one more time just to, to plug whatever you do or where folks can find you because, you know, you don't just serve here on the Mac jury only. Um, Jeff, uh, we'll go in reverse order again. Uh, where can we find you as if we didn't know? <laughs> uh, well, I guess on every podcast. No, um, you can find me at MacObserver.com. And sometimes I write about the weird things people do in coffee shops at freshbrewedtales.com. You can find me on Twitter. I'm Jay Gamut, And then on a bunch of podcasts, including the, the newest one that I, that I started, which is Mac Observer's Daily Observations. Great. And that's a daily podcast, folks, you really should pay attention to. Oh, thanks. Josh? Uh, yeah, you can find uh, my my day job work at tidbits.com, where I'm the managing editor, and I write a lot of the articles there. Uh, my ramblings and all the things bouncing around my head get posted to my Twitter account, at jcenters. And you can find my books at takecontrolbooks.com, and, and those right now include iOS 9, a Take Control Crash Course, and Take Control of Apple TV, which is painfully out of date at this point, but... 
if you buy now, <laughs> buy now for just five easy installments. No, but if you buy it now, uh, the, whenever the update comes out, and I'm not quite sure when that will be, but when I do, we do get it updated, you will get uh, the new one, the new version for free. And if you follow him on Twitter, folks, what's bouncing around his head is a little scary at times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was thinking colorful. Uh, that too. Okay. Okay. Uh, Bard, help me out. Where can folks find you? Okay. Well, my two podcasts are at letstashtalk.ie. So there's a monthly Apple podcast and a monthly photography podcast. And then you can find anything else I do at uh, bartb.ie. Great. Gentlemen, thank you so much for serving on the Mac Jury. This has been a lot of fun, as it always is. We have a lot of laughs, and hopefully we've given some folks uh, some, some guidance and some things to think about. We'll see you again soon. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices, uh, the Mac Jury on Mac Voices. We will be back again soon as well. We hope you'll join us. Until then, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard, by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.